the main stores of water and we're also going to be considering how water is moved between those stores. So if we look at this diagram we've got on the left hand side here we can see that um, water is stored within lots of different subsystems of the earth, lots of different spheres. The word hydrosphere, that's the word we use for all of the water um, that's on planet earth in any of its forms, so either liquid, um, gas or ice. Water is also found within lots of other stores and it's moved between those stores and it's important that we understand the relative size of those stores and also um, how the water is transferred between them. So water is present within the biosphere. Biosphere refers to all of the living things, plants and animals um, on the planet. It's present in the lithosphere. The lithosphere is the, the hard, rigid outer shell of the planet, so the rocks and soils beneath our feet. It's present in the atmosphere, which is see the blanket of gases that surrounds the planet. And it's also present in the cryosphere, um, which is the name we use for all forms of water that are frozen. So um, snow, ice caps and glaciers, um, and even permafrost would come under um, that bracket of the cryosphere. When we think about the hydrosphere and we think about how that water, all of the water on the planet is broken down, um, we can break it down in a couple of ways. So if we look at this diagram on the right hand side, we can see that of all the water on planet Earth, 97% of that water is found in the ocean and only 3% of the water on planet Earth is fresh water. So the oceans absolutely dominate um, the, the the, the store of water on the planet. Only 3% um, is actually fresh water. So we're talking about a relatively small fraction of fresh water. When we break that fresh water down, think about how that fresh water is stored, actually a lot of that isn't um, accessible and easily available at the surface um, in the form of rivers and lakes and so on. 99% of that fresh water is locked away. And it's either locked away in ice caps and glaciers, which account for 79%, um, or it's locked away in the groundwater, so the deep stores of water um, beneath our feet. Only 1% of 3% of all the water on the planet is actually um, easily available to us um, as surface fresh water. If we have a look at that 1% and we break that bit down again, we can see um, that there are two main stores of surface fresh water that again kind of dominate that um, uh, dominate the proportion of those stores. So lakes over half of the um, surface fresh water, soil moisture accounting for another 38%, um, and then 8% within the atmosphere. That leaves only 1% for rivers and 1% um, within the biosphere. Now, as we go through the topic, we're not too worried about um, the amount of water within the biosphere. We won't come back to look at that too much. We will look at um, how the amount of water in rivers fluctuates. But atmospheric water plays a really important part, actually, even though it's only 8% um, of that surface fresh water. The water in the atmosphere plays a really important role in our planet because... Um, water vapour is actually a greenhouse gas so the amount of water vapour actually goes on to determine um, you know what our climate is like the climate obviously then goes on to determine things like how much water is stored in ice caps and glaciers or how, en how much of that ends up in the ocean um, so we shouldn't dismiss this eight um, percent as being a really small amount actually although it is small it kind of packs a bit of a punch it punches above its weight um, in terms of the significance of that water. If we think about um, how water is actually moved around, there's a few really important processes that are driving changes um, in the size of these stores of water. Now what's happened over time, um, because the Earth's um, water cycle is a closed system, that is, there's a fixed amount of water on the planet, um, because it's a closed system, um, Naturally, the planet has reached what we would call dynamic equilibrium. Um, the water has naturally um, found itself... I'm going to start this bit again. 
So as well as the size of different stores, we need to consider how water is moved between those stores. It's important to remember that the water cycle on a global scale is a closed system. There's a fixed amount of water on the planet and we don't lose any, we don't gain any, it's just moved around. Now over time, over millions of years, Earth has pretty much reached a bit of a dynamic equilibrium whereby the amount of water in the atmosphere and the oceans and the groundwater isn't really changing very much. Um, you could argue that when we introduce human activity into the mix, things like climate change and um, extracting groundwater for our own consumption, that does mess up that dynamic equilibrium. Um, but broadly speaking, you know, the amount of water um, that's going falling out of the sky as precipitation is absolutely equal to the amount of water that's going back up into the sky, um, into the atmosphere through evaporation and transpiration. So these um, processes are, are in balance in the long term. Um, as well as water moving between these stores, so moving from the oceans into the atmosphere, from the atmosphere into rivers, from rivers into the sea, it's also changing state as it moves between some of those stores. So water is either freezing or melting as it's being transferred between the cryosphere and um, the lithosphere or the hydrosphere. It's evaporating and condensing as it's being transferred between, um, for example, the oceans or the land and the atmosphere. And in some cases, we actually get this direct transfer between um, ice and water vapour. So particularly on glaciers, when the sun is shining down on them very intensely, um, that has the option there or the possibility there um, that that water can experience what we call sublimation. It's where the ice is converted to water vapour without becoming a liquid um, in the first instance. And deposition is the word we use for the alternate um, process whereby water vapour um, could become um, a solid without becoming a liquid uh, first. If we want to um, spend a little bit of time now, I'm just going to have a look at um, some of these processes in a little bit more detail um, and we're going to start particularly with um, precipitation. Precipitation, rainfall, snowfall um, is a really really important element of the water cycle. We've got three examples here um, of different types of precipitation. Um, when it rains, it's generally raining for one of three reasons. Um, before we look at the specifics of each of these types of rainfall, it's important that we understand the broad things that these three types of rainfall have in common. In all of these examples, the air is rising, it is cooling down, the water vapour within that air is condensing and then we get rainfall. So that's the process that happens whenever we get precipitation occurring. We have to have had the air rising, cooling, condensing and then rainfall occurs. In each of these examples different things, different mechanisms are causing that air to rise. So if we look at this first diagram on the left hand side, convectional rainfall is driven by the intense heating of the sun. So the sun's rays are beating down on the land surface and the ocean surface. They are heating it up, they are causing water to evaporate, they're causing that hot air to become less dense and they're causing that air to, to rise. As it rises it's going to get higher up into our atmosphere where it's colder and therefore any water vapour within that air is going to condense. As it condenses droplets are going to form, those droplets are going to get bigger and bigger until the clouds get bigger and bigger and ultimately no more water can be held within the atmosphere and it starts to rain. We have to remember that warm air holds more water than cold air. So when you take that air, warm air from, from sea level, and you take it higher up into the atmosphere and you cool it down, you're reducing the amount of water that can be stored in that um, in that mass or that pocket of air. If you reduce it to the point where it's saturated, um, that's when you're going to get rainfall occurring. As I said, all three of these types of rainfall involve the air rising. It's just different mechanisms causing that air to rise. So with relief rainfall, or what we technically call orographic rainfall, 
the air is being forced to rise over hilly mountainous areas okay so you can imagine we've got some wind blowing in off the sea it's bringing lots of moisture with it as that air hits the mountain it's going to rise up be forced upwards over the mountain um, and believe it or not um, it's colder at the top of a mountain than it is at the bottom that's why sometimes mountains have got snow on the top and no snow at the bottom because it's colder at the top of a mountain so that air that was nice and warm down at sea level is now quite cold as it's got up towards the top of the mountain the cooling air condenses forming clouds and rainfall. Um, what happens though when the air sinks down the other side of the mountain, what we call the leeward side of the mountain, um, it tends to be quite dry and it creates uh, what we call a rain shadow. Now we even have this um, evident in the UK, places on the west coast of the UK, um, places like uh, Dartmoor and Snowdonia and the Lake District, where we've got high ground on the west, uh, they tend to be quite wet. Um, whereas when the air descends and moves further east, um, maybe out towards sort of southeast of the UK, Kent and Essex and Cambridgeshire, um, the air is much drier and therefore they get less rainfall. And the bigger the mountain, the more pronounced this rain shadow is. So in some parts of the world, huge deserts exist on the leeward side of mountains. Deserts like the Atacama Desert are in the rain shadow of the Andes. Um, deserts like the Gobi Desert in um, Asia, they're on, in the rain shadow um, of the Himalayas. So it's not uncommon um, to find very, very dry conditions on one side of a mountain um, or range of mountains and wet conditions on the other side. When we get to frontal rainfall, it's a bit harder um, to really kind of see what is causing the air um, to rise in this case. Um, one thing that's maybe worth thinking about um, is the fact that the air on this side um, of uh, the diagram, we can think about this air here as being quite warm air. Okay, This air is warmer um, than the air on the other side. Okay, And here we imagine we've got a big pocket um, of cold air. Excuse my pretty terrible handwriting. Um, where warm and cold air meet, they have different densities. It's a bit like oil and water mixing um, or colliding. They don't mix together very well. They don't just sort of become one homogenous um, air mass. We get these two distinct bits. We've got warm air, we've got cold air, and we've got this sort of boundary between them. And this boundary is called a front. You might hear um, weather forecasters on the news talking about um, a weather front coming over the UK, bringing us lots of rainfall. And this is exactly what they're talking about. And they're talking about an imaginary or um, invisible rather line between warm and cold air. So in this case, where the warm and cold air meet, um, the cold air is gonna be denser, it's gonna be heavier. So the cold air is gonna be trying to sink and push its way underneath the warm air, which is gonna kind of shove it upwards a little bit. And as we can see with these arrows, the warm air is going to be rising upwards over the cold air. So where they meet, the warm air is less dense, so it rises. And as it rises, it's going to do exactly the same as it did in these other two diagrams. It's going to cool down and it's going to condense um, and we're going to get rain forming. So all of these different types of rainfall, all these different processes, um, very significant in controlling you know, how much water we have in different parts of the world. We have a look at this map here, shows you um, the amount of rainfall that's received in different parts of the world. Um, and the, the dark blue colors here represent the, um, the largest levels of rainfall, um, down to the sort of yellows and oranges where there's much, much less rainfall. We can see that that rainfall is really, really concentrated um, in tropics tropical areas yeah so imagine the equator pretty much runs along there okay the tropic of um, cancer runs pretty much along there and the tropic of capricorn runs pretty much um, along here so between these tropics okay the tropic of cancer and the tropic of capricorn that's where most of the earth's precipitation is concentrated um, either side of that We've got large areas of deserts, about 30 degrees north, um, about 30 degrees south of the equator, um, where that air is much drier, and that's driven by um, the circulation of our atmosphere. 
We can also see that polar areas, um, areas towards um, you know, the north of Canada, um, northern um, Scandinavia, northern Russia, they tend to be quite dry as well because colder air, where the air temperature is cold up here, um, can't hold as much water. So you tend not to get um, as much rainfall where the air is colder. And again, I mentioned some deserts earlier that are in the rain shadow of mountains. This is the, the area around the Gobi Desert um, and the sort of um, Tibetan Desert up here. This is all driven by the fact that you've got a big mountain range um, of the Himalayas running along here. So precipitation varies from place to place because um, the air is different temperatures on our planet. We've got warm air near the equator and between the tropics which is going to hold much more moisture um, than that colder air near the poles. Another really important set of processes which are driving changes in the stores of water are what we call cryospheric processes, processes associated with snow and ice and glaciers. Um, now we don't need to worry too much about um, you know, the specifics of how glaciers work, but it is important that we have an understanding of um, certainly how water moves into or out of um, a glacier. So on the left hand side here we've got a typical kind of cross section of a glacier on the side of a mountain um, and towards the top of that glacier uh, where it's colder we're going to have snow being added to that glacier. We call the addition of snow to a glacier we call it accumulation. That's the word we use when snow is added to a glacier. That snow might come from precipitation or it might even come from kind of avalanches on the side of a mountain um, depositing snow onto the glacier. Over time that snow squashes down on the snow below it and the next year's snow squashes down on top of that and very um, slowly the air is squeezed out of that snow until you're left with really really solid ice. That glacial ice moves downhill um, and eventually will will melt and the melting um, or ablation um, is the term we use for uh, the loss of ice from a glacier. Um, that ablation occurs um, more in the summer than in the winter uh, but can happen throughout the year depending on where the glacier is. So melt water might run off in streams and, and rivers off the front of the glacier um, chunks of ice might break off, um, you know, like an iceberg carving off the front of a glacier that meets the sea. Um, and even some of that ice might evaporate um, or even through sublimation might be returned. Um, some of that water vapour will be returned to the atmosphere. Over the course of the year, different processes are going to be dominant at different times. So in the autumn and winter, OK, we can see... Um, that on this graph here, accumulation, the addition of snow to the glacier, that's going to be higher um, than ablation, Okay, the, the loss of ice from the glacier. The cold temperatures um, are going to be less melting and they're going to be more snowfall. So the glacier is kind of filling up at this point. The glacier is growing, it's getting thicker, more and more ice is being, um, being added to it. Okay, um, Whereas maybe in the spring and summer months, um, the opposite is going to be true. Ablation or melting is going to be higher than the addition of new snowfall because it's less likely to snow in the summer um, and the warmer temperatures mean we're going to have a little bit more uh, melting. Now over time what happens is we should get a nice dynamic equilibrium whereby the melting um, or the, the positive um, balance um, in the winter is equal to the negative balance in the spring and summer but over a long period of time the glacier doesn't really change um, in size it might get a little bit smaller in the summer get a little bit bigger in the winter but it's broadly staying the same size um, that would be fine that would be true if the climate um, stayed steady um, as we know that doesn't happen either naturally or because of human activity the climate fluctuates quite significantly okay 
Um, we can see on this graph here, this shows you from 800,000 years ago right through to the present day, um, we can see uh, the average temperature of the planet. Okay, um, And we can see that um, at times in the past, um, the climate has been much colder than it is today. And at other times in the past, here for example, we can see that it's been as warm, almost as warm as it is today. In some cases, a bit further back, it's been even warmer than it is today. So the climate of the Earth is swinging between these warm and cold periods. Um, the warmer periods are called interglacials, whereas the colder periods are called glacial periods. Um, so as a result of changes in Earth's orbit around the sun um, and in changes with volcanic activity, um, the Earth's climate gets colder and warmer on fairly regular cycles. There's a bit of a wiggle going on here as it's quite a complicated pattern, but roughly um, every sort of 100,000 years um, we have a cold period um, followed by a very brief warm period or interglacial um, at that point. Now when these interglacials or glacial periods occur, um, water is going to be either moving to or from the cryosphere. Um, as temperatures get colder, more snowfall is going to fall, so more um, water is going to be locked up in glaciers and ice sheets, and the sea level would go down. The opposite would be true in one of these warmer or interglacial periods. As temperatures warm up, less precipitation would fall as snow, more of the ice sheets would melt and water would be transferred to the sea and sea levels would rise. Um, and we can see this happening today. Um, sea levels are rising as climate change causes temperatures to rise um, and that causes ice sheets and glaciers to melt. Um, but the change has actually been even more stark in, um, in the past, as we'll see. So this graph here, um, this shows you just three different glaciers in Alaska um, and how over time their balance, their, their budget, uh, glacier budget, has become negative. So rather than it being zero would be balanced where the glacier is not getting any bigger and it's not getting any smaller, we can see that over time those glaciers have become more and more negative and that's as a result of, um, of changes to our climate. Um, I talked about sea level rise and you can see um, on this diagram on the left hand side here, this shows you the sea level um, around the UK and France and, and the Netherlands and sort of northern Europe during um, the last ice age or at the end of the last ice age. So about 16,000 years ago, you can see that we've got um, a big ice sheet kind of here sat over the north of Scotland um, and you can see the outline of the present day coastline outlined in brown. Okay, but what you'll notice um, if you look um, at this uh, kind of dark green colour here, um, this shows you um, that this area was actually above sea level 7,000 years ago. Okay, um, and so 7,000 years ago you would be able to walk from London yeah, from the south coast of the UK all the way across to what is now France without really getting your feet wet. You might get them a bit wet in this river that's running down the middle here, but generally speaking, you'd be absolutely fine walking all the way across from London to France because the sea level was about 120 metres lower than it is today. That's astonishing, really, to think that sea levels have risen by 120 metres um, since the end of, of the last glacial period, the last ice age, um, if you like. Um, as I said earlier, the same phenomenon is happening today um, and is predicted to happen um, into the future. So the map on the left hand side here, this shows you potentially, and this is a kind of worst case scenario, um, potentially which areas of the UK and um, other parts of Europe, I mean, look at the Netherlands um, down here, um, parts of Belgium um, down here absolutely would be absolutely inundated um, as a result of sea level rise um, if 
large areas of Antarctica um, and Greenland were, were to melt. So cryospheric processes are very, very important in transferring water between ice caps, glaciers and the oceans. During colder periods, the sea level falls because the water is locked up on the land in ice caps, whereas during warmer periods that ice melts and the water makes its way back to the sea, causing um, sea levels to rise. The final thing I just want to say about water cycle processes and water stores um, is the concept of residence times, because water doesn't spend the same amount of time um, in each of the stores. Some stores only hold water for a very short period of time. Other stores can hold them for really, really significant amounts of time. Um, this diagram here shows you the, the average residence times, um, the average amount of time um, you know a water droplet might spend um, in each of these stores. And we can see for things like the biosphere or the atmosphere, that's a relatively short period of time. You know, a few days, um, maybe a week or so, um, the water stored in those stores um, for a very, very short period of time. At the other end of the scale, um, we look at things like groundwater um, or ice caps and glaciers and permafrost. We can see that we're talking up to maybe thousands or even tens of thousands of years um, in terms of how long that water is stored for. Um, so once the water maybe uh, falls as snow and gets locked away in an ice cap, it's going to be locked away there for a very, very long time. Um, don't be too confused by this um, figure here, the fact that it's saying it could be stored between two weeks and 10,000 years. I realise that's a, a very, very broad time scale, isn't it? Um, that's because it depends how deep into the groundwater um, that water actually goes. So if it just sort of trickles into the surface groundwater um, and ends up in a river relatively quickly, that could happen in a couple of weeks. But if it makes its way deep into the groundwater, um, particularly in maybe um, one of the, the fossil aquifers that we've talked about in lessons, then that water could be there for tens, if not hundreds of thousands of years um, before it's released back into uh, maybe the atmosphere um, as a result of uh, maybe being pumped out by by human activity um, or seeping its way into, into rivers. So the residence times can vary really, really significantly um, between those stores. And it tends to be that the larger stores of water, remember the groundwater and ice caps and glaciers, they accounted for the largest stores of fresh water. They actually um, tend to store uh, water for the longest amount of time compared to things like the atmosphere um, and rivers and biosphere which stored less water um, and they tend to store it um, for a much shorter period of time. So in summary then uh, what we've covered in this in this session we've looked at um, the fact that water is stored in all of the earth's spheres all of the main subsystems within the planet um, store water and water is moved between them. Only a very small percentage of Earth's water is actually fresh water. Um, and then only a very small fraction of that fresh water um, is actually available at the surface in terms of being found in rivers and the atmosphere and soils and lakes and so on. The main processes responsible for moving water between the stores are things like evaporation, condensation, precipitation, um, and those cryospheric processes uh, that we've been talking about. They are fundamental in moving water between all of the different stores. And finally, the residence time refers to how long water is um, held in a particular store. And that can vary from you know, a few days to a week for the biosphere up to tens of thousands of years when we start thinking about the cryosphere or the groundwater.